Well, well, well. It has been quite a while since we have met here, but better late than never, if I do say so myself. Welcome back, everyone, and welcome back any new people to the Runaway Train Sports Podcast. It has been an extremely long time since the last uh the last upload slash recording of this podcast by my own accounts i believe it was november 12th of 2020 that my last episode of this podcast was recorded and that episode was previewing the northwestern game not the you no know, most recent purdue basketball game the northwestern football game so it has been quite a long time since i have donned the microphone and well had the time slash motivation to get out and record this and we are finally making our triumphant return to the audio or video depending on where you're consuming this uh this new episode so welcome back i thank you all for your patience to any new viewers who i hope uh, I have drug into this small web of a community. Welcome. This is hopefully a new weekly. Um, it was my goal at the beginning of 2021 to kind of turn this podcast into a weekly thing. It has taken me over a month to get into it, but I figured now is better a time than any to go ahead and get this thing going. So my goal is to have these out on Mondays, kind of talking about the previous week in produce sports and kind of any big uh you know big things that are going on but seeing as this has been the first episode in a very very long time i figured we could kind of one do kind of a quick recap on everything that has happened up until today both the end of football as well as basketball i want to talk about probably spend a majority of the time talking about basketball season because we are in the very 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 much of the thick of things when it comes to men's basketball and then finally i want to talk about the definition of a successful season for this purdue basketball team because i think a lot of people are having those kinds of discussions now that we are nearing the end of the regular season as we um as we hit you know mid-february so first and foremost as i mentioned before the last episode that we did of this was the northwestern preview for football and I think that Northwestern game kind of really knocked the motivation out of recording the follow-up. And I think I actually took, if I remember correctly, a bit of a break from even writing. Um, because, man, that Northwestern game was a very, very... It was a heartbreaker because, man, it was a little bit of a, um, a fall-flat moment. I think Purdue kind of really, really struggled down the stretch for football. And we don't have to go into football in much detail because a lot has happened. I think we'll probably touch on a lot of those storylines as we near... Um, in a couple of months as we near the fall uh, sports season. But football kind of whimpers down the stretch, actually not even playing their last game against Indiana due to COVID issues um, kind of surrounding, and it kind of became a mutual thing. A mutual thing, air quotes for those who are listening to the audio version, that um, Purdue and Indiana did not meet um, in football this year. Purdue finishes in near the bottom of the Big Ten West, and many fans are left wondering exactly what went wrong. But of course, as one um, sport ends, another begins. And the 2020-2021 Purdue men's basketball season gets underway. And here is where I want to kind of mix in the what I meant about defining a successful season. This was absolutely going to be a big question mark year for Purdue basketball due to the, you know, not necessarily high-profile transfers that left, but definitely the impactful transfers that left at the end of last year. Matt Harms and Nojel Eastern announcing that they will not be returning to Purdue for their senior seasons and will instead choose to take their talents elsewhere. Since then, Matt Harms has done okay um, from what I've seen at BYU, definitely not lighting it up as, you know, many people assume that he would um, attempt to do. So he has, you know, had up and down moments at BYU and Nogel Eastern, who has been a roller coaster um, of a follow since his announcement that he'll be leaving the program, um, kind of 
you know, I think caps off kind of what was going on around him. He is currently not attending any university and is apparently um, preparing for the NBA draft slash NBA season. So we wish him luck on his path. But, you know, obviously losing those two guys, they were our two seniors on this team. And so you were all of a sudden left with a handful of juniors and a lot of freshmen, both of the um, red shirt and true variety. So I think coming into the season, I think the idea of success was something around, you know, not necessarily it. I think success comes to the simple point of not regressing, getting solid play from your juniors and, you know, seeing that leadership growth now that they were all of a sudden thrust into this, you know, they are the oldest class that we have. Purdue does not have, any scholarship seniors so they all of a sudden are being thrust into this leadership um, role i think you want to see solid play from brandon newman and mason gillis obviously electing to redshirt last year um, now we can look at now is obviously a very very good decision as we move towards the future but in the beginning of the season you wanted to see you know what that redshirt year did for them and would would they be able to come in and kind of help fill the gap or at least stem the tide um, with these departures of Nojo Lister and Matt Harms? Then, obviously, there are the true freshmen that are coming in. Obviously, there is a lot of hype around Jaden Ivey. I think there was also a fair amount of hype around Ethan Morton. I think Zach Eady was one of the bigger question marks when it came to... Um, how much would he play? How developed is he? He obviously has only been playing basketball for a couple of years. And so it really was a question of would he be able to play? Is he destined for a redshirt year? And so you kind of just wanted to see a foundation of play from the freshman to kind of be able to take that and roll it into looking towards the future and then getting an idea of what this would look like before. Obviously, you're being locked. Um, your rock on this team is Trevion Williams. Down low, he absolutely was Purdue's best player last year. His steady play kind of helped Purdue. You know, he, he was, like I said, that foundation. And we definitely needed him to be that this year as well with these freshmen, which we know can be a little bit streaky and can be a little bit inconsistent as they try and adjust to play, especially in the Big Ten. So... The, we'll break it down into a couple of different segments, kind of taking a look at the season so far. Um, the non-conference, Purdue begins the season with a nice, you know, a pretty decent 13-point win over a solid Liberty team. Um, I don't think many people, it definitely didn't move the needle in terms of name recognition. You know, it didn't have that, you know, instant eye test, um, jump off the page name. But I think that was a solid Liberty team that Purdue got a win over in their first game. And then the second game against Clemson, they end up losing by 11, and I think this was the first game. You know, being the second game of the season, we didn't really see it necessarily in the Liberty game, but this was the first time that we saw some of that inconsistency and the inexperience from the younger guys as Clemson's pressure defense definitely got the better of this young team and kind of you know their physical aggressive style of defense definitely pushed Purdue out of their comfort zone and Purdue could never really get on track um, in that one they rattle off a couple of wins against Oakland and Valparaiso um, definitely nothing too um, worrisome about that you know they had a 43 point win against Oakland and then a seven point win over Valpo which I think was another one of those games that um everyone kind of really struggled in if i remember correctly purdue then traveled to miami for the big 10 acc challenge we're not going to be talking about that one because pain and then they finished up well their second to last non-conference game comes against indiana state a very good 12 point win over indiana state purdue then welcomes uh ohio state to the not-so-friendly confines of Mackey Arena to open Big Ten play, where they ended up walking out with a win, 67-60. to This was a very good win for Purdue, and has definitely turned into a great win for Purdue since. I remember OSU was missing a couple of their more prominent um, players, but still, this was a game that not many people may have thought 
Purdue would come out on play like they did. They held Ohio State kind of at arm's length down the stretch and ended up walking out with a nice seven-point win. Following up the Buckeyes win, Purdue played Notre Dame in Indianapolis in the Crossroads Classic and came out with a solid 10-point win over a very average Notre Dame team. Um, Always good to get a win at the Crossroads Classic. Can't complain about that at all. Purdue then traveled to Iowa and definitely... And I won't touch on this one too bad. I'll just say that, man, I really wish that we had another shot at Iowa as Purdue falls by 15 at Iowa and Iowa City. Following that up, we'll kind of start running through these a little quicker. Um, A three-point win in Mackey over Maryland, which has kind of been an up-and-down win as the season goes. A very close loss at Rutgers, 81-76. A... Closer, but also not as close as you would think. Loss at Illinois, 66 to 58, which Purdue had a chance down the stretch, but just couldn't make enough plays to really close the gap finally. And I think that was more of an inexperienced thing. Kind of, you'll you'll notice that in some of these losses, Purdue plays well. It's just you. It could kind of boil down to, you know, these freshmen not necessarily being there yet you can see the foundation but they're just not there yet so then Purdue's next game against Nebraska has been post was postponed due to COVID issues with Nebraska still has not yet it's still yet to been rescheduled there are questions about whether it will be rescheduled so uh, that is still up in the air and then next we have Purdue's probably the best four game stretch of Purdue season so far they traveled to uh, Michigan State and overcome a almost 20-point deficit to win by one on a Trevion Williams, not necessarily last second field goal, but a beautifully designed out-of-bounds, um, baseline out-of-bounds play to get Trevion Williams a floater with about three seconds left, and then Michigan State did not get their last second shot to fall. Purdue walks out of Michigan State with a one-point win against the then-ranked Michigan State, which has kind of fallen off a cliff since then. Purdue then traveled to Bloomington and probably a, a game that many fans were a little more nervous about than um, they had been in the past. Purdue ends up getting a very good win, 81-69 to in Bloomington for their, let me see if I can remember this, fifth straight in Bloomington. Their, what is it? It's fifth straight, eight in a row, and 11 of the last 12 against the Hoosiers, which is big plus. Definitely can't complain about that one. Um... It's always fun to go down and win in Bloomington. And then Purdue tweeting out the absolute shadiest tweet. Just Shaden Freud all over the place after that game. Excuse me. That was a very fun game to watch. It was a very fun game to see the IU fans melting down on Twitter afterwards. Then, then Purdue, then welcomes Penn State, who this was their first game after being on break for a couple of weeks due to COVID issues. Purdue wins a very, very, very physical, tough game against Penn State, 80-72. to Then Purdue travels the return game to Ohio State, who then was number 15. And Purdue walks out with a two-point win on a last-second Jaden Ivey deep dagger ice in his veins three. The first of many for the young freshman. So that is definitely Purdue's best four-game stretch of the entire season, winning three out of three of them on the road. Two of which were then ranked teams. You know, Michigan State has kind of fallen off a cliff a bit since then, but you know, in the moment, it was a very good win. Winning and then winning at Indiana always a great sign. A tough, aggressive uh, Penn State team getting that win, and then the winning on the road at Ohio State, who had, I, I believe, some. I can't remember who else was out but they had the players who were originally out in their first matchup were back but someone else was out so they were still short-handed but they definitely had the strength of their team back and Purdue goes on the road and sweeps the Buckeyes who have been, now climbed into the top 10 and potentially will be climbing up even further potentially closer to the top five as the AP rankings are released today. Purdue then plays Michigan and a game that Man, Michigan just dominated from the same. Michigan came out and just, you know, asserted themselves. And you could see the difference between a, you know, upperclassman heavy Michigan team and a lower, um, an underclassman 
heavy Purdue team as Michigan takes down Purdue 70 to 53. Then Purdue goes on a bit of a break. I think it was an eight game, eight day break before welcoming. Then ranked Minnesota to Mackey and comes out with a near 20 point win. Very good. A disappointing loss at Maryland where Purdue kind of gave up a five point lead, I believe, with a minute and change left. That was a little disappointing. Purdue falls by one. And then another hard fought game against Northwestern, our most recent, our most recent bout. With the Wildcats, Purdue comes out on top 75 to 70, in which down the stretch gave Northwestern a bit more of a chance than they should have, as Purdue has continued to struggle against full court pressure this season. And I'm not too worried about that going forward, but Purdue holds on, shooting 23 of 24 from the free throw line. That was a very, very fun stat to see. So that is Purdue season up to now. They currently sit at 13 and 7 with an 8 and 5 conference record. Currently sitting tied for fourth in the Big Ten with uh, Wisconsin currently, who has kind of started to have a bit of negative momentum um, as we continue on. So, how has the season gone so far? We've obviously looked at each game kind of on a surface level, but as looking at the season so far as a whole, I count this season as an absolute success. Um, I don't think many people were expecting Purdue to battle for a top four finish in the conference. I don't think people were expecting that the freshmen would be playing up to this level yet. I think they definitely still have their moments where you can see the inexperience um, kind of poking through. But as each game goes on, you can just see the confidence of this group growing. You can see the foundation really beginning to take hold. And you cannot help but just get more and more excited about the future of this program. I know I, for one, am extremely, extremely excited. But I want to continue on talking about the definition of of a successful season. But first, I'm going to take a quick break to drink some water because I've been talking for a bit um, now. So stay tuned. We're going to continue to talk about the definition of success as well as kind of take a look forward towards the end of the season and produce postseason standings as of right now. We'll be right back. All right. Welcome back. As I mentioned before that quick break, we're going to kind of take a quick look at the rest of Purdue's regular season and kind of touching on what success has meant up to now and kind of what success, at least to me, looks like towards the final six games of this regular season, or seven if they end up rescheduling that Nebraska game. It doesn't seem like they are, but just in case, we'll mention that as well. So quickly, Purdue's final six games of the regular season that is currently scheduled are at Minnesota, home versus Michigan State, at Nebraska, at Penn State, home against Wisconsin, excuse me, home against Wisconsin, and then home versus Indiana. Up to this point, as I kind of mentioned before the break, success for this season was no regression, solid play from your upperclassmen, and moderate to moderate for moderate success for the true freshmen and solid outings from the redshirt freshmen Brandon Newman and Mason Gillis. I think at the beginning of the season, you're fighting for a middle of the pack Big Ten finish, and you are fight and you should be in the talks for an NCAA tournament at large bid. I think as Purdue, as it stands right now, using that as our benchmark of success, Purdue has absolutely blown it out of the water. I think the play of the redshirt and true freshmen are way above the level many were expecting as of right now. I think the upperclassmen play has been solid. Trevion Williams is definitely um, what everyone thought uh, he would be. He's currently leading the team in points as well as field goal percentages, and I believe rebounding as well. Yes, he is rebounding almost 10 10 a game. I think the thing many people haven't seen or are maybe a little surprised about is the emergence of Sasha Stefanovic as one of the offensive foundations of this team. I know he has always been, you know, thought of as a pure shooter, but he has really shown that he's willing to expand his game and show a lot of different things. He has been out um, for the last you know week and a bit. I can't remember how many exactly days it was. I think it was like 17-ish days. So he missed three games due to COVID. Um, he tested positive. Um, I believe it was 
oh, what was it? I think it was after the Michigan game. Or before it was before the Michigan game. He tested positive, so he missed the Michigan game, Minnesota game, and at Maryland game. Um, and the Northwestern game was his first game back. And you could feel Purdue missing him on the floor, both for a spacing thing as well as, you know, having that presence on the floor. So I think his emergence as both a leader, energy guy, um, as well as on defense, he's kind of really taken a step up on defense as well. Um, so I think that has been a very, very big success so far this season and kind of going forward. I think it's also talking about defense. We definitely be want to uh, dismissal to not talk about Eric Hunter Jr. and kind of the, the step up he's taken on the defensive end. In the Minnesota game, he took Marcus Carr, one of the Big Ten's leading scorers, and basically put him in a box for you know 40 minutes i think he ended up with i think six or so points but he think he he was held scoreless through the entire first half and didn't get his first field goal until more than a few minutes into the second half so eric hunter jr has absolutely taken that role of lockdown defender for himself and kind of put it on his shoulders so that has been absolutely great to see as well i think a lot of people look at eric hunter jr and kind of see his not necessarily lack of production on offense but I think after last year where he kind of took that scoring role a bit more personally, he's kind of been, you can see he's kind of been willing to take a step back and kind of spread the ball around a bit more. He currently leads the team in assists per game at a little over three. So I think Eric Hunter Jr. can definitely not be overlooked when it comes to positive upperclassmen um, interaction and gameplay. So I think he's definitely been a very, very successful piece to this as well. So I, up to now, the season has absolutely been using the criteria I mentioned at the beginning earlier, um, make the you know, battle for NCAA tournament bid, you know, battle and conference and you know, set the foundation going forward. Now that we've done that and we've seen what we have so far, what does success mean going down the stretch and into the NCAA tournament. I think Purdue needs to go 4-2 and two down the stretch to be considered a success. I think the game at Penn State could be tough. Penn State has played in a very, very aggressive style of um, basketball, and this Purdue team kind of wilts a bit under that aggressive style. So I think that could be a very tough one. And then the home game against Wisconsin is always tough and this Wisconsin team is one of the you know most experienced in the Big Ten they know what it's going to be like to come into Mackey even when there's no fans and I think they're going to have the presence of mind to you know pull it out if they play well they kind of been stumbling a bit recently so if they manage to pick things back up um, it could be a bit of a tough one for Purdue but the game against MSU uh, Michigan State is not playing very well right now um, the game at Minnesota also concerns me a bit. That one may... The, the game at Minnesota is very interesting because Minnesota is kind of sliding right now. But they all have... But Marcus Carr has a you know the ability to kind of go off whenever on any given night. And so it really is determinant on um, which Purdue team comes to play. And I will see because it is Purdue's next game. So that Minnesota game is a little bit of a toss-up. The game against Michigan State, I want to see Purdue come out and just handle MSU because MSU is also sliding a bit right now. They've got a couple of wins in their last couple of games, but they've also had a couple of tough losses, but they are not the same Michigan State team of the past couple of years. And so I want to see Purdue handle their business at home and beat Michigan State. Nebraska has been on pause most of the year. I think this will probably be only like their fourth or fifth game back after being on pause for so long. I want to see Purdue go on the road and get another um, road victory over Nebraska. I have talked about the Penn State game. I talked a little bit about the Wisconsin game and the um, finale, the um, home game against Indiana. Um, I think it's going to be a lot of fun just because it's always fun to play Indiana and it's always fun to play Indiana at Mackey. Now, Indiana has kind of started to figure things out. Um, they most recently got a big win over Iowa at home. So they got the season sweep over Iowa, just like Purdue got their season sweep over Ohio State. It seems like Archie Miller has finally realized that he needs to let his freshmen play, you know, their own game, not necessarily for try and force them into a mold. So 
you know, there's a couple more weeks um, for them to kind of get things figured out. So I think that could turn into a bit of a battle if, you know, Purdue doesn't step up to the plate and doesn't take that game as seriously as I hope they do. But that season finale against Indiana could be a lot of fun, and I'm hoping for a 50-point Purdue win, if we're being completely honest. So down the stretch, I would love to see... I would love to see Purdue go four and two minimum. Obviously, that can you know change on any given night, but I think that's what I would love to see going forward. And then looking past that, I think it's been announced, maybe not necessarily officially from the Big Ten, but it seems as though the Big Ten conference tournament will be moving from Chicago to Indianapolis. Um, I have no idea what to make of the Big Ten tournament. I have no idea what's going to happen. I have no idea what's going to look like. So I'm not going to talk about it too much. But as of right now, as I mentioned, Purdue's currently tied for fourth place in the Big Ten. Um, we'll see where they end up, um, you know, as we obviously go down the stretch here and other teams get to play as well. But then comes the NCAA tournament, which I believe, from what I've seen, Purdue seems to be a pretty consensus um, five seed as of right now. I think if Purdue goes four and two down the stretch, they may be able to push themselves up off that five line to a four seed. Um Personally, um, seeing as the 5-12 upset is one of the biggest things, and all I can see in my nightmares is is Purdue getting a 5 seed again and um, catching a 12 seed at the the wrong time. So I would love to see Purdue push up into that 4 seed um, area and kind of be able to avoid that 5-12 matchup as best I can. We're not going to be looking at any potential matchups as of now because, as I mentioned, they're still weeks and weeks away from that being any clearer but currently Purdue sits as a five seed and I would love to see them you know push themselves up to that four seed and then you know we'll it'll all come down to matchups from there but I would love to see Purdue make another another solid outing in the NCAA tournament not necessarily making any elite eight runs or anything but a solid a solid showing I think would be great for this team to get them that postseason experience and be able, hopefully, be able to catapult them with a bit of confidence into um, into next year. So that's kind of a brief recap and you know, kind of brief look forward at Purdue men's basketball. So I think that's going to kind of conclude that portion of this. And I guess, <coughs> excuse me, um, the last thing is kind of talking about. I mentioned at the top of this episode that you know I want to start making these weekly episodes. So if you keep an eye out on Twitter, at Boiler in Texas, um, hopefully every Sunday I'll be um, posting a tweet asking for questions um, that you may want answered, um, topics you may want me to top, talk about or you know interact in, and I'll definitely be um, keeping an eye on that. I also have tentative plans to potentially live stream this. Um, potentially moving it to a Sunday evening um, setting or maybe a Monday night setting and potentially um, live streaming it to allow fans the opportunity or you, you know, everyone else, all of the other fans to come and interact um, live if you all feel so inclined. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, but definitely more, I'm talking about it more in the future as we go forward. Um, we'll continue to shift and mold and change this as we go but for now my goal is to continue to do these things weekly kind of continue getting back in the habit of making these because man it is a lot of fun to talk purdue sports but for now i believe that will wrap things up here um next week we will let's see what's today today's the going to be the it's going to be the eighth so um by then we'll be the next episode will come out right before the Michigan State game, so we'll have the Minnesota game to talk about, and we'll hopefully be able to preview the Michigan State game a bit. Um, so keep an eye out for that next Monday. But for now, I thank you all for listening to the Runaway Train Sports Podcast. This has been episode 14, the first in a long time, but hopefully the first in a long series in a row to come. But for now, and as always, boiler up. Hammer down, hail Purdue.